This course will serve as an introduction to Rhino 3D. This is a great and easy tutorial for Rhino beginners and can serve as a crash course into 3D modeling in Rhino. I'll give an overview of the following. What Rhino 3D is. How to navigate the Rhino interface. Rhino commands, what they are and how to use them to design 3D objects. How to use the viewport display modes to change the way you view your model. Viewport navigation controls to help you view and move around your model. The different geometry types available in Rhino. Layer control. Tools that allow the transformation and manipulation of these geometries. The Rhino gumball. Guides and geometry snapping. Then we will apply what we have covered to a precedent exercise where we will create a 3D model of architect Bjark Ingels Serpentine Pavilion in Rhino. We will then create simple image exports of our 3D model. And we'll finish by examining some of the new features available to us in Rhino 8. Rhino is a 3D CAD modeling software used widely for the design of 3D objects in various design fields such as architecture, product design, multimedia, fabrication and rapid prototyping. It's developed by software company McNeil and Rhino is known as quite a flexible modeling software balancing the ability to create models with high precision tolerances with tools that allow the creation of freeform shapes and highly complex models. This makes it a great tool for creating both highly conceptual sketches and precise design work for fabrication and manufacturing. Rhino also comes with a plugin called Grasshopper, which is a visual programming language environment that extends Rhino's capabilities and allows for the creation of more advanced generative algorithmic modeling. We won't cover Grasshopper in this course, but we have another great course available for beginners who want to learn the basics. We will be using Rhino 8 for PC in this course. Rhino also comes available to Mac users, however some of its features may appear slightly different. Let's start by looking at the Rhino interface. When you first open Rhino, you'll be prompted to specify the units you'd prefer to model in. I'll be using millimeters as my units in this course, and this basically means that any value we input into Rhino will be in our specified units. At the top of the window we have a typical drop down file menu bar, which gives us a set of grouped tools we can use in Rhino. Below this you can see a collection of graphic icons. These are our toolbar groups, which allows quick access to different types of file, display, selection and modeling commands in the program. On the left we have similar graphic icons. These are more related specifically to 3D modeling and are known as the quick modeling command icons. Your icon toolbars might look slightly different to mine, but don't worry, if you want to customize them you can click on the gear icon at the top right of the screen. Our screen is split into four sections, which are called our modeling viewports. This is where we will view and edit the 3D objects we create inside Rhino and gives us a number of helpful perspectives to view our model from. By default we have a top view in 2D, a perspective view in 3D, a front view in 2D, and a right view also in 2D. These viewports are also customizable. You may have noticed the grey grid with the red and green lines in our viewports. This is known as our C-plane. Rhino works with a coordinate system, similar to a Cartesian plane. Our C-plane defines the flat surface we'll be using to create 3D models with, as well as the X, Y, and Z directions of our coordinate system. The red is the X direction, the Y is the green direction, and the Z is not shown, but it is the up direction, perpendicular to the C-plane. At the junction between the X and Y is our origin point, known as 0, 0, 0. If we move our cursor around in our viewport, we get a preview of our cursor location in the coordinate system in the bottom left of the Rhino interface. On the right we have our panels. If you can't see the panels, click on the Windows drop down menu at the top and select Panels. My personal preference is to always have the following panels open and docked. The Properties panel, which gives us information about any object we have selected. The Layers panel, which allows us to organise the geometry in our file. The Rendering panel, which gives us control over visualisation of our objects in the Rhino viewport. The Display panel, which allows us control over what we can and can't see in our viewport. The Named Views panel, which allows us to save views we can revert back to at any time and the help panel, which lets us ask any issues or queries we might have. At the bottom we have the snapping tools, which add precision to our 3D modeling. We will talk about this in more depth later. And most importantly at the top we have a white space for what's known as the command bar, which forms the basis for modeling in Rhino. Rhino is known as a command based modeling software, and the command bar is probably the most important feature in Rhino. What this means is that anything we want to do in Rhino can generally be controlled by simply typing into the command bar. This is great for beginners because instead of having to memorize the locations of icons to create things, it's really easy for us just to type into the command bar what we want and most of the time Rhino will guide us. If we want to create a box we can just type box and if we want to draw a curve we can type curve and so on and so forth. The command line will then respond with options on what to do next. 
So when using Rhino, it's critical to always watch the command line and respond to prompts. Let's write our first command in Rhino. I think we should create a box to begin with, so let's type in box. You can see Rhino gives you a list of commands with the word box in them beneath the command line, almost like a search function. If you want to do something in Rhino, it's worth sometimes just typing in and seeing if a command exists. Let's select box and our command line will update. It's asking us now to define the first corner of the box. Next to this we have a few different options which give us different ways to create a box. We're going to use the standard one for now, but if we clicked on these, we'd be able to create a box in a different way. Let's click once in our perspective viewport to create the first point in our rectangle. Let's click again to create the second. Now it's asking for a height. We could type in a height to set an accurate height, but instead I'm going to click in space again. And there we have it, we've created our first box in Rhino. When using Rhino, it's critical to always watch the command line and respond to prompts. You may have noticed our box looks different in the perspective viewport when compared to the other viewports. This is because each Rhino viewport has its own display settings. We can easily change the display mode settings in each viewport. The view drop down menu contains default viewport types that we can change to. Let's change our perspective viewport to wireframe mode to match the other viewports. We're now seeing only the edges of our box with no shaded faces. If we change back to shaded, our faces will reappear and mask out the edges behind. Each viewport display mode has a different use, and typically when modelling we would use either shaded or ghosted. Let's change to ghosted, which gives us a nice blend between shaded and wireframe. You could also use rendered viewport, which is really good for creating quick sketches and images of your model. The rest are specific viewport types and I encourage you to experiment with each of them. You can also create customised viewports by navigating to view, display options. My personal preference is to model in shaded, so I'll use shaded in this course, but it's very common for people to use ghosted when modelling in Rhino as well. Let's talk about viewport navigation and how we can move around our 3D model in Rhino. A typical way of moving around a 3D model is wanting to zoom in and out, which is similar to any 3D modelling software. If we go to our perspective viewport and use the scroll button on our mouse, we can easily zoom in and out of our 3D model. We can also do this in all other viewports. There's also a way to zoom with more control. If you hold down the control key in your keyboard and the right hand button on your mouse, you can move the mouse up and down in your viewport to zoom in and out with greater control. You can also do this in other viewports. Another typical navigation tool is called panning. Let's go to our top viewport and hold down the right hand mouse button. A hand icon will appear which is the panning icon. You can move the mouse to pan around our object. We can also do this in front view and in right view. When combining zooming in and out, we can get a lot of control over our viewport navigation. When you go to perspective mode and try to pan, you'll notice our model rotates instead. Our top, front and right views are orthographic 2D views, so you can't actually rotate in 2D. When you're in a 3D viewport, the panning control changes. To pan in a 3D viewport, hold down the shift key and the right hand mouse and drag. You can combine panning and rotating in 3D to get greater control over your view. Next let's talk about selecting objects. We can select objects in our Rhino viewport by clicking on them with our left hand mouse button. Our selected objects will turn a light yellow colour. We can deselect any object by clicking off in space. If we select the object again, we can also deselect by hitting the escape key. You'll notice when we select an object, it lights up in all viewports, which is really helpful for us to locate our geometry when we have a more complex model. Another way to select objects is with the Marquee Selection tool. Let's go to our perspective view, and if we hold down the left hand mouse button and click in space and drag from left to right, we can draw a rectangular selection window. If the window covers an entire object, the object will be selected. Multiple objects can be selected like this. If we create a window that doesn't cover the entire object, it won't be selected. If you're creating a marquee tool from left to right, you need to cover the objects you want to select. There's a second selection marquee method that works from right to left. A right to left marquee will have a dashed line. This indicates that anything the inside marquee touches will be selected, which gives you greater control over your selection. So to recap, a left to right marquee needs to cover the entire object or it won't be selected. A right to left marquee just needs to include a small amount of the object and it'll be selected. These selection tools work in all viewports. Typically when we're modelling, we want to work in one viewport full screen. If we navigate to the perspective viewport and double click on the perspective name, the viewport will become full screen. We can double click on the perspective name again to go back to our split view. 
This works for all other viewports by double clicking on their names. In Rhino, there are a number of different geometry types we can use to create 3D models. Rhino typically uses geometry types called NURBS geometry, which stands for Non-Uniform Rationalized B-Splines. NURBS geometries are built from mathematical equations that are typically defined by a series of control points. Let's take a look at a few of these geometry types. I'm going to come up to our perspective viewport and make it full screen. Let's take a look at the points geometry first. Points are typically used as guides for locating parts of other objects in space, and they don't really add much to your 3D model. I'm going to type in point into the command line, and Rhino's going to ask us to specify the location of a point object. I'm just going to click arbitrarily in space, and you'll see we've created our first point, which appears as a white dot in space. We can create points in a number of different ways. If I type point again, I can specify a specific location, so 0, 0, 0 at our origin point, to create our next point. There's actually a shortcut to how we can create points at our origin, however. I'm just going to undo this point with the undo command, and I'm going to do a marquee selection and delete the other point over here in space, and then I'm going to type in point again. And this time, instead of typing 0, 0, 0, I'm just going to type 0 once and hit return, and you'll see our point appears at the origin point. Whenever we use a command in Rhino, we can actually hit the spacebar again to repeat the previous command. So let's hit the spacebar, and you'll see the point command hits again. So we can easily go and hit spacebar and click and create lots of points all at once. Another type of geometry you'll commonly use are curves. Curves can also be used for locating objects in space, but they're also useful for geometry creation as well as line drawings. There's a few types of different curves we could create. We could create a line by tapping line into the command bar. And the line will ask us to specify the start of the line and the end of the line, which we can do by clicking. We can also create a polyline, which works by clicking once and then you'll be specified to click again and continue until you hit return to complete your polyline. We can also create a control point NURBS curve by typing in the curve command. This will work similar to the polyline command, except it'll create a curve of best fit through some specified control points. You'll see how this curve doesn't actually flow through the direct points that we've created. Just hit return once you're done. If we wanted to create a curve that went directly through all these control points, we'd have to use a different command called interpolate curve. So let's type interp curve into the command bar. This time, when we click, you'll notice that the curve fits perfectly through the points that we're specifying in our screen. We can also easily create polygons. So let's type in polygon, and I'm just going to create the standard one that I've got here, which is a hexagon. I'm going to click once and specify the radius. But if you remember, I talked about how you always want to watch the command line. And we can actually affect the type of polygon we're created through this. So let's hit return, and we're going to now go up to the command line and change the number of sides to 5 to create a pentagon. So now I can click on screen, specify the radius, and I'll create a pentagon. So always watch that command line for options that you can change in your commands. Another really common geometry type in Rhino are surfaces. Surfaces are one of the main building blocks for geometries in Rhino. They're single skin geometries that can always be unrolled into a rectangular shape. Let's use the plane command to create our first surface. I'm going to specify the first corner of this plane, and then the other corner, and then we've created our first surface. We can also create surfaces within closed curves. I'm going to create a circle just below our plane, and then I'm going to select the circle, and I'm going to use a command called planar surface, and this will infill a surface inside that circle. Now remember, I mentioned before that these surfaces are actually underlying rectangles, so we could use a command to unmask what this surface actually is. That command is called untrim, so let's type untrim into the command line. It's going to ask me to select the edge of the surface to untrim, so I'm going to select the edge of that circle, and you'll notice we now get this rectangular bounds of what the underlying surface is. We can go ahead and trim this geometry out by using the trim command. I'm going to select the curve as my cutting object, and then select the outside of the surface to trim back so we get that circle again. So just remember that any surface that you create in Rhino can actually be untrimmed back to a rectangle. It's just a mathematical equation that's set up that's the basis for all the geometry we're using. Poly surfaces are the other major geometry type we will use in Rhino. They're essentially a collection of surfaces joined together. For example, let's create another box, and this is an example of a poly surface. I'm going to type in box. 
Now this box is actually made up of six smaller subsurfaces and we can show this by using a command called explode. So let's select it and type explode into the command bar. Now you'll see if I click off, I can select each of these surfaces one by one. So it's actually made up of smaller subsurfaces. I could then select all six of these subsurfaces and join them together and you'll see in our properties tab that we've created a closed poly surface. Now a closed poly surface is basically telling us that the poly surface that we have has no holes in it, but it indicates the existence of something that's called an open poly surface. Let's use a command called delete faces to delete one of these faces of our poly surface. So I'm just going to go here and click on this front face and I'm going to hit return. And now I've got an opening and when we select this poly surface, you'll see in our properties, it's now an open poly surface. So this encapsulates most of the NURBS geometries we'll be using inside of Rhino, but there's also other geometry types we'll typically use in lots of our workflows. One of these geometry types are called meshes. So meshes are a collection of small triangular or square faces that attempt to approximate curved geometries. For example, let's create a sphere. I'm going to type mesh sphere into the command line and it's going to ask me to specify a center point of the sphere and then create the radius of it. So you can see straight away that this sphere has all these kind of jagged edges. It's made up of a collection of smaller faces that are trying to approximate the curvature of the sphere. We can actually create a NURB sphere inside of Rhino really easily as well. So let's type in the sphere command. This is actually a surface, so I'm going to model it with my other surfaces. The nerve sphere is actually a mathematical equation. It doesn't really exist in real life. It doesn't have any faceted faces, unlike the mesh sphere. The mesh sphere serves as an approximation of what that sphere is. You can adjust some of the options in the command line when creating a mesh sphere to make that approximation a little bit less defined and increase the number of faces on that sphere. You can also create other geometry types with meshes, such as a box. So let's type in mesh box and create one of those as well specify the corners and the height, and there's a whole collection of other mesh geometry types that you can create inside of Rhino. Another newer geometry type inside of Rhino that was added in Rhino 7 is something called SubD. SubD is a spline-based polygonal geometry type that allows for the creation of accurate continuous geometries. It's a great tool for freeform modeling and sketching, and we've got an entire course on the different design available if you want to learn more. Let's create a sub-D box, so let's type in sub-D box to the command line, and it's going to be the same process to our other sub-D creations. But you'll notice when we created it, it looks quite blobby and strange. Sub-D geometries have two visibility settings. There's the smooth setting, and then there's the unsmooth setting. And you can actually toggle between these using the tab key. These forms exist to give you greater control over your sub-D modeling. Another geometry type inside of Rhino is the text type. We can go and add text into our 3D model. So let's go and create some text to label some of these categories we've created. I'm going to type text into the command line and hit return. And I'm going to type in points because I'm going to categorize my points. And then I'm going to make the height 0.5. And the command line is going to ask us to specify a location. So I'm just going to put this above my points. And so I'm going to skip ahead and let you go and add the rest of the labels to your scene as well. There are also many more geometry types like point clouds, dimensions, and text dots that are available in Rhino that can be helpful for a variety of different modeling tasks. So I encourage you to explore all of these as well. Like many other programs, Rhino has a layer management system that is critical to organizing your document's workflow. Currently, all our geometries are on one layer. So let's create some new layers and customize them so our document's a bit easy to read and use. I'm going to come to the layers panel on the right and I'm going to select these colored layers we've got here by default. I'm going to select them all and then come up to this red cross and delete them. Then I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to call this layer points. Currently all the geometry we've created so far has been modeled on the default layer in Rhino. So I want to go and change the layers of each of these geometries and we can do this by selecting our geometries. So let's select our point geometries with a marquee selection. Then I'm going to right click on the points layer and select change object layer. There's a few ways we can test that this change has worked. We could turn on and off this light bulb on our points layer, and you can see that the points in our geometry will turn on and off, which tells us that it's on the correct layer. We can also change the color of this layer, and I'm going to click on this little color icon here, and I'm going to change this to a blue color. We can also lock these points, so if we don't want to accidentally move these points out of their current location, we can click on this little lock icon, and you'll see if I try and select the points now, I can't select them or accidentally move them around. Let's create another new layer and call it curves. Let's select the curve geometries and its text, and this time we're going to use a command called change layer. A change layer dialog box will appear. 
Let's select the curves layer that we want to change to and then click OK. We can toggle that light bulb on and off and we'll see that the curves have changed layer. Let's change the color of this layer as well. I'm going to make it red. Let's create another new layer and let's call it Others. Within this, we're going to create sub layers for all of the other geometry categories. So to create a sub layer, click once on the Others layer so it's selected and then come up right next to the new layer icon and click new sub layer. I'm going to call this layer Surfaces. Let's create another sub layer below this. To do this, don't click sub layer again, click another new layer below. Let's call this poly surfaces. Now, rather than clicking the new layer icon all the time, we can actually hit the tab button, and this is a shortcut that will enable us to create a new layer. So I'm gonna hit tab and call this layer meshes, and then hit tab again and call this layer sub D. Let's go and select the surfaces and change these geometries to the surface layer, and do this for each of our geometry categories. If we go and lock our surfaces layer, you'll notice that we can't select our surfaces, but we can select other geometries inside of that group. I can also turn the surfaces layer on or off, and that won't affect the other layers either. But if I go and lock the others layer, you'll see we get these semi-locked icons and all of the sub layers under others. Now if I try and select any of this geometry, you'll see I can't, and this tells me that all of these layers are now locked. So these layers are actually inheriting the locked status of their parent layer, the others layer. This is true for visibility as well. If I turn the others layer off, all of the sub layers will turn off as well. One thing that sub layers don't inherit, however, is colors. So if I go and change the others layer to say a dark green color, you'll notice that none of the sub layers actually inherit this color. This is the same for material layers as well. I could now go and change the surfaces layer to a different color, say a cyan, and you'll notice that that sub layer inherits its own color. So you could see how this would be useful for more complex projects like a building, where you might want your floor slabs on one layer, your windows on another, or even for designing options in a project that are all neatly organized onto layers. After creating our geometry, we have a number of transformation tools that can allow us to manipulate geometry further. Let's start with a simple box. I'm just going to go into perspective mode. And we're going to try and move this box. I'm going to type move into the command line and it's going to ask us for an object that we want to move. And then it's going to ask us to select a point to move from. So let's click arbitrarily in space. And then you'll notice as we move our mouse, we get a preview of where we're going to move this box to. The command line's asking us to specify a point to move to, and when we click, the box will move. We can redo our move command by hitting the spacebar again. And this time, instead of clicking twice, let's specify a distance. I'm going to go with 300, so it's a very accurate movement, which gives us a lot more accurate control over our transformations in Rhino. Let's select our box and type rotate into the command line. We'll be asked for a center of rotation, and then an angle or a reference point. If we move our mouse around, we're able to rotate freely around that center point. And then we can click to specify the rotation. We can also rotate with a specific angle. So let's rotate again, and then type 45 as the angle we want to rotate by. I'm just going to undo this back to the start. We can also copy our geometry. Let's type copy into the command line. Copy works the same as the move command, except we can continue copying until we hit return. We can also scale our geometry so it becomes smaller or larger. Let's type in scale. We're asked to specify a base point, and then a scale factor or reference point. If we click again, we can then drag and preview our geometry at a smaller or larger scale. We can also scale more accurately. Let's repeat the command, and this time, let's type a scale factor of 0.5, which will scale our box by half. Another transformation command that's really useful is orient 3 point. It'll ask us to specify three points, so let's click 1, 2, 3, and they will serve as reference points for where we want to reorient this geometry to. If we click off in space, we can get an understanding of where this will be oriented. Always watch your command line for options that you can change. Our command line is asking us if we want to copy or scale this as well. I'm going to toggle copy onto yes, so I create a copy of this geometry when I run the command. Another really interesting transformation tool is the array tool. Let's type in array, and we're going to be asked for the number of arrays in the x, y, and z directions. 
Let's go 5 in x, 4 in y, and 1 in z. Then it's going to ask us to specify a rectangle, which will show us a preview of this array. Once we're happy with the rectangle, we can click again and we'll have an array of that geometry in the formation that we've specified. Let's undo and look at another array command called array linear. Array linear works similarly, but actually allows us to array objects along a line that we draw. I'm going to do six objects in my array and then specify a line. You can see the preview appearing before we've drawn our second point. Let's touch on a couple of other helpful tools in Rhino we can use to navigate and select and manipulate our geometry. If I select this box, I select the whole thing, but what if I wanted to select the front face only? If I hover over this front face and use shift, control and left mouse button click, I'm actually able to select into the face of this geometry. I could then manipulate the geometry with things like the move command and move that face out on its own. I could even rotate it or use some of our other transformation tools as well. This extends to other properties within our geometries as well. I can select the vertices of our box with shift control and click as well. And I can also select the edges with shift control and click. And I can manipulate these with our transformation tools as well. In Rhino 8, we can actually use Smart C Plane that automatically align to objects that we've selected. If you come to the bottom of our interface and select Auto C Plane on, we can test this out. Let's use Shift Control click on that front face again, and you'll see that the C Plane automatically aligns to that front face. You could do this with the top plane as well, or the side plane. This enables us to also draw on this C Plane. So if I use a polyline, I can draw around this and you'll see that this polyline aligns to that C-plane we've selected. I'm going to go back and turn our auto C-plane off and delete that polyline. Another really helpful tool for navigating around our viewport when you've got lots of geometry are the zoom tools. So let's create another array to demonstrate this. What if I want to zoom in specifically to this box over here? I can type in zoom and then hit S for selected and it'll zoom straight into the geometry that I have selected in my Rhino viewport. And if I want to go back and see everything in my scene again, I can type zoom and go E for extents, which will show me all the geometry in my scene in the window. These tools are really critical for navigating around your scene when you've got a complex model. The Rhino Gumball is a widget that we can use to make geometry transformations faster and easier. Let's create another box to demonstrate this. Let's come to the bottom of the screen and turn the gumball tool on. Now when we select any geometry, you'll see a colourful icon appear in the middle. This is the gumball widget and it allows us quick and easy transformations of our geometry. Let's look at the movement arrows first. If I click and hold with my left hand mouse button on the red arrow, you can see I can drag and move the box along the x axes. I could do with the same with the y axes and the z axes. I can also click once on either of these axes and specify an accurate movement, say of 20 millimeters. The colorful arcs you see are the rotational widgets on the gumball. They work the same as the move. If I click and drag on the blue one, I can freely rotate the object. I can also click once and specify an angle that I want to rotate at, say for example, 90 degrees. These control squares at the bounds of the geometry enable us to scale in a certain direction. If I click the red, I can scale along the Y axis, and if I click the green, I can scale along the X axis. If I click and hold down shift while scaling, I can actually scale the entire geometry uniformly. If we right click on the gumball settings, you'll see that we have a few different options. Let's demonstrate one of these. What if we created a plane in Rhino? And then we rotated that plane at an angle. You'll notice that our gumball follows the orientation of the plane. However, when we deselect the geometry and reselect, the gumball's orientation has reset to the transformation of the C plane that we have. So sometimes it's really helpful to have the gumball aligned to the geometry you're using. To control this, right click on gumball at the bottom here and select align to object. And the gumball will update its orientation to your geometry, which makes it a lot easier to manipulate and transform the geometry. There are a number of ways we can gain greater accuracy over our transformation tools in Rhino with guides and geometry snapping. For example, what if we wanted to move or copy in a direction aligned to our C-plane axes? We can do this easily by using the ortho tool. 
If you come to the bottom of our interface, you can toggle ortho on or off. Let's select one of our geometries and move it. You'll notice as we move now, the movement axis is snapped to the X and Y axis of the seaplane. This gives us scope for really accurate transformations of our geometries if we combine it with movement based on specific dimensions in millimetres. We can also toggle the ortho off and off as a shortcut using the shift key. Holding down shift will toggle ortho off and allow us to move freely and letting go will snap back to those axes. So we can swap between these two to get greater control easily. If we right click on the ortho tool we also have a series of extra options. Let's set the ortho angle to something different from 90 degrees. I'm going to go with 45 degrees. And you'll notice when I try and move this time, I'll get these 45 degree snaps with my ortho tool. I'm going to set the angle back to 90 because that's my preferred workflow. One of the most critical features in Rhino that allows for accurate 3D modeling is the O-Snap tools, which is a series of tools that let us snap our cursor to specific parts of geometries. Let's demonstrate a few of these. Our O-snaps live down on our bottom left. Let's enable these by unchecking disable. I'm going to turn the end O-snap on and I'm going to type move. And you'll see now as I hover over these kind of corner points of the box, my mouse actually snaps to these end snaps that specify these corners, which accurately lets me click into the specific points of that geometry. So I'm going to move from this end here and I'm going to move to the other end of the geometry. We can also try the midpoint snap, and I'm going to move from this midpoint here to the opposing end corner. So we can use these snaps in tandem with each other. So you can see how this is a really powerful tool for accurate modeling. We could place a point on our canvas and turn the point snap on, and then move from our end point of our box to the point in space. We could also draw two lines that intersect and turn the intersect snap on and then move from our endpoint to the intersection of those curves. I'm going to undo this and just slightly scale one of these curves so it's a bit longer. And then I'm going to turn on the perp snap and move this box so it aligns perpendicular to this curve we've created. We can also snap to circle geometry characteristics. I'm going to move this box and turn the center snap on, and I can snap to the center of a circle. I could also turn the quad snap on, and then move from this endpoint and snap to the quarters. Sorry, I'll just turn my perpendicular off. I can snap to the quad quarters of a circle. We could then turn our near snap on, and our near snap allows us to snap along the edge of a curve or a geometry. There's a collection of other snaps like knot and vertex that you can also look at that allow you more accurate modeling. And if we try and move our box and hold down the control button while hovering over the snaps, you see we have a whole selection of other hidden snaps that you can also use to extend those capabilities. Another tool that increases accuracy in conjunction with the O snaps that we can use is smart tracking. Smart tracking allows us to create temporary invisible alignment guides that we can use to align objects to one another. Let's turn it on at the bottom here. And let's just draw a line. And then I'm going to select our box and I'm just going to move it to the origin. Now I'm going to move the box and I'm going to hover over the end point of this line. And you see I can pull back and align the end of that line to the edge of my box to create a new kind of alignment without actually drawing any curves. I could also move and align to this end, so that white line that you see is our smart tracking guide coming into play. One last modeling tool I would like us to look at is planar mode. Planar mode allows us to keep drawing along the same plane as the first point that we specified in our drawing. Let's look at this in practice. I'm going to draw a polyline, and I'm just going to draw a closed polyline from the end point of this box. It looks pretty good from this view, but when you rotate around you'll see that most of the points have snapped to the C plane at the bottom, and so we get this weird angle. So let's delete this polyline. And we'll try again, but this time we'll turn on the planar tool. So let's create our polyline again and we'll click around. And now you notice when we rotate into the other view, it's actually aligned to the same plane as the first point that we clicked on.
Now that we have a basic understanding of how to create geometry in Rhino and how to control the transformation and manipulation of our geometry, let's try and apply these ideas to a precinct study. We will be examining an architectural pavilion by Björk Ingels, otherwise known as Big, commissioned by the Serpentine Gallery in London. The Serpentine Pavilion by Big was built in 2016 in the Kensington Gardens in London. The concept for the design of the building was an unzipped wall that was transformed from straight line to three-dimensional space, creating a multifunctional structure that housed a cafe, family activities, and a program of performative works by artists, writers, and musicians. The pavilion consists of a stacked collection of extruded fiberglass frames. When viewed from different angles, the pavilion can appear transparent or solid, and this play of opacity and transparency is intended to provoke a reconsideration of how we perceive space and form. So let's have a go at making this in Rhino. Let's come into perspective mode and create a base module for this. Now, the module of the pavilion is approximately 500 by 500 by 400 in height, so let's create our box for that. And let's do a zoom selected to reorient. Next, let's array this module to create a flat version of the unzip wall to get the approximate scale. I know that the wall has 53 modules in the Y direction and 34 modules in the Z direction. So let's use Array Linear to create our 53 modules. And then we'll do a Zoom Extents. And now we'll select them all and we'll do another Array Linear in the Z direction for the 34 modules. And now we've got an approximate scale of the size of the pavilion. Next we want to add the curvature to the wall. I've got an image of the pavilion in plan and we're going to try and trace the curvature of this image. Now there's a few ways we could bring this image into Rhino. We could type in the picture command and we'll be prompted with a dialog box to specify an image we want to bring in. Or we can simply copy an image to our clipboard. So I'm going to right click on this image and select copy. And then go control V into Rhino. And then it's going to ask me to specify the corner and the starting point of this image. So I'm going to select the picture, and I'm going to move from this corner here. And I'm going to align it with the corner of the geometry we've set up. Next, let's rotate the picture from that point again, and we're going to align it to this straight length in plan. And then we're going to line that up and rotate it to the direction of the dummy wall we've created. And the last thing we want to do with the picture is scale it. So let's scale from this starting point again. And I'm just going to come underneath and find the extent of our picture wall and scale it up to the length of the dummy wall. So now our plan's in the same scale of the pavilion itself. Next, let's do a little bit of layer management. So let's come up to the layers and we'll delete all of these extra layers that we have. I'm gonna create a new layer called picture. I'm gonna select the picture and right click and change it to the current picture layer and then I'm gonna lock the picture layer so that we don't accidentally move it. Let's create another layer called module and let's move all of our bricks onto this layer. Now we want to create the form for both sides of the unzipped wall. I'm going to create a layer called wall 01 and a second layer called wall 02. Within each of these, I'm going to create a sublayer called curves. Let's make this layer a blue color and we'll do the same thing for the other wall. I'm going to make the curves layer under wall 01 the current layer by double clicking. Now what we want to do is trace the curvature of the picture in plan. Let's create some dummy lines that represent this solid wall so we can turn the module layer off. Let's start in this corner here and draw to the other edge. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side. And then let's turn our module layer off. Let's go into top view and let's start drawing our curves. I'm going to use interp curve which we used previously. And we're just going to click and approximately get the points going through the curvature that we see in plan. And I'll just add an extra point here. And then snap to that end. So you see the curves encroaching into this zone between those two straight curves. We want to avoid that because that'll cause some issues for our modeling later. If you click once on the curve, you can actually select all the control points and move each of these control points out of that line. So just move these out until we get it approximately right.
and that looks pretty good. So next let's create an interpolate curve and I'm going to smart track to this edge here and then I'm going to trace the other side of the wall just like so. We'll just get it approximately right and then smart track to the end here like that and hit return. And now we're going to go back to perspective mode and I actually want to move these two straight curves upwards to the height of the modules. So let's move them, we'll turn the modules back on and move them up. And then we can turn the modules off. Now I'm going to create a new layer under wall 01 and I'm going to call it loft. And loft is the name of the command we're going to use. Let's make it red. A loft essentially creates an approximate form through some 3D curves. So if we select these two curves and type in loft, so I'll just change my layer to loft, sorry, and we type in loft again, we'll get this surface geometry that approximates between these two curves. Let's do this for the other side as well, so we'll create another loft layer. We'll select the top and the bottom curve and type loft. And now we have an approximation of what the pavilion might look like. I'm not super happy with how it's looking, so let's go to front view and evaluate it a little bit more. I'm going to turn front view to shaded mode. I want to bring in an elevation of the pavilion and compare it to the geometry we've got. So let's bring in this picture into Rhino. So let's right click on this picture and go copy. And we'll make picture the current layer and control V that into our Rhino model. Now I can't quite see what's going on here, so I'm going to go to top view and just move that picture back so that we can see it properly in right view. I'm also going to change to ghosted mode so I get a bit of an x-ray looking through. So let's just go and try and align this picture to the approximate scale of the pavilion. So I'm going to just move this to that corner there, and then I'm going to scale, uh, we'll just scale from this point here, it doesn't have to be totally accurate, up to here, just like that, so it's about the right height that we need. And you can kind of see that our lofted form doesn't really follow the actual curvature of the pavilion in elevation. So basically what we want to do is we try, want to try and replicate this form inside of Rhino. So we need to use a different method or workflow to create this curvature. I'm going to disable our snaps for a second and then I'm going to make the current layer the curves sublayer in wall 01. Just to give us a chance to trace this elevation out and get these curv this curvature correct. So let's create another interp curve, and without any snaps, we're just going to arbitrarily trace over this image. Just like this, and we'll just get up to the top there, and now click on it to get the control points, and we want to move out of that zone again where that module wall is. I'll just turn our module layer on again, and just massage these points around a little bit, and that looks okay. So we'll do the same thing for wall 02. And we'll create another interp curve, and from the bottom, we'll just go again. So don't worry about it not snapping and being too accurate just yet, because we'll fix this up in a second. So click again, and just make sure that those control points aren't encroaching in that in-between zone of the wall. Cool, that looks good. So now if we go to perspective mode, because we had no snaps on in our front view, all of the curves have been drawn at that flat origin plane, but they're not actually snapping to any of our geometries. So let's select the curve on the right and we're going to adjust the control points of the first point and the last point of the curve to align and snap to the bottom Z height and the top Z height of the pavilion. Let's select the top control point and we're just going to turn our snaps back on and move that point back into alignment with the module. And then let's come down to this bottom control point and we're going to move this as well. And we're going to try and use a smart track to align to this base curve here. So make sure you're snapping to your smart track there. Just get it approximately in the same location, but at the same Z height. That looks good. Now we want to align this to the location of this curvature, which is where this bulge is. So let's draw a line and make sure your quad snap is on. And I'm going to go with this quad and just go directionally out. And then we can do a scale 1D of our profile curve. So we're going to scale it so it comes out to this bulge and then we're going to move this profile curve into the bulge and that's where that curve will sit to help give us that shape. So we're essentially creating a 3D wireframe of these bulges. Let's fix up the curve on the other wall. So I'm going to go to the top point, we'll zoom in, and we're going to move that end point into the top corner of the wall. We're going to do the same thing for the bottom, we'll get our smart track going and just align that back to the Z height and the approximate location.
Now we want to select that curve and we'll do a scale 1D. We're going to scale from this point here out to that profile curve on the base. And now we want to do a copy of this curve. And we're going to copy it to the other end of the pavilion and create another version that scales to the opposite bold. So we'll select that new copy. We'll do a scale 1D. And we're going to scale it out to this base profile curve again. Now let's turn the, let's turn the picture off. And we're just going to do some layer management because I think these might be on the wrong layer. I'm just going to make sure that they're all correctly on their um, relevant curve layers. And let's just turn the module layer off as well. So we're trying to create a wireframe of these bulges. Now I want to cap the ends of this front bulge here as well so that it's completely got ends on it. So let's draw some lines. A line from here to here just to cap that end and a line from here to here to cap that end. I'm going to turn off the back wall and we can see that curves on the right layer so let's change it and let's just look at this specific wall one. I'm going to create a new layer in wall one called sweep and this is the new workflow and the new command we're going to use. Let's make it a dark green and I'm going to make it the current layer and sweeps the name of the command we're going to be using to turn this wireframe into a 3D geometry. The sweep command essentially creates some 3D geometry along a rail that you define based on some profile curves that run through the rail. There's two types of sweeps you can use, a sweep with one rail and a sweep with two. In this instance, let's use sweep two. So I'm going to select a top rail and a bottom rail, and then these three curves in the middle as our profile curves. And I'll hit return, and we get a preview of this geometry. And let's go OK. Now if we go to top view, we see this bulge is encroaching back into that no-go zone that we were trying to avoid before. So let's undo this sweep, and we're going to add one more profile curve. So let's make curves our current layer, and we're going to draw a line. I'm just going to draw a straight line approximately here, just to pull that bulge out. I'll turn the perpendicular snap on, and then we'll do another sweep. We'll make sweep the current layer. We'll select the top curve and the bottom curve, and then our new four profile curves and hit return. We'll just check first, it doesn't look like it's crouching in, so that's good, we'll go OK. And now we've created the first form of the first wall. So we can go ahead now and do the same thing for wall 02. So let's create a new layer called sweep, we'll make it a dark green, and hit OK, and we'll make it the current layer. I'm going to turn wall 1 off. Now we want to make curves the current layer and just create a profile curve straight so we avoid that bulge again just here. Now let's go back to the sweep layer, and we'll type in sweep 2, we'll select the top rail, the bottom rail, and each of these profile curves, and hit return, and now we can look in plan, and we're not encroaching into that uh, zone that we want to avoid. So now we've got basic approximations of these two wall geometries in the Serpentine Pavilion. So next we want to create a cavity between these walls, and the cavity is essentially what will contain the box geometry that gives them their thickness inside of the walls. So I'm going to select this wall one sweep geometry and I'm going to do a copy and I'm going to copy it back 500 millimeters, which is the thickness of our modules. And this creates a cavity between these two objects. So what we want is we want it to get thicker at the bulging point and then thin out towards the ends. So I'm going to select the copy that we've made and we're going to do a scale 1D and let's go for its base point here. And I'm just going to kind of pull it back a little bit so we get a larger cavity at that bulge area of the pavilion. And what that will mean is we'll have larger boxes in that bulging area in the final pavilion. So let's do the same thing for the second wall. Let's do a copy, 500 millimeters across, and then let's select it and do a scale 1D from the origin, and just try and get a bit of a larger cavity where those two bulges are happening on this wall. Just like that. So now we're ready to start creating some boxes. I'm going to come to wall 01 and create a new layer called trim. Let's make trim the current layer and we'll make it magenta. Let's turn off wall 02 for a second and we want to copy one of the module boxes over to the trim layer. Let's copy this base box at the bottom here. And then we'll turn module off. And I want to make it a really long box, so let's use the gumball to stretch it, and we'll just move it into alignment with the pavilion. What we're trying to do here is create another dummy wall with all of these trimmed pieces of geometry. 
So we're going to array these long boxes just like our module wall. We're going to do one thing differently, however, because if you look at the module wall and the pavilion, it's actually got a bit of a checkerboard pattern where every second module is missing. So instead of arraying by 500, let's array by 1000. And we want to do half the number of what we did in our previous array. So we'll go with 27. So let's go array linear, 27. And that's looking good. And I know that the geometry on this side of the pavilion is actually offset. So let's select all those arrays and we're going to move them 500 across. And then we're going to do a copy of this array upwards to get that checkerboard pattern. And we'll come over here to the left and just delete this extra piece. And now we want to array this collection of checkerboard geometry. So let's go array linear again. And we're going to do half of what our heart was. So I think that's going to be 17. And so that goes up to the top there and looks good because it encapsulates that entire wall geometry. So now we want to use the trim command. We've used this command previously to trim out a surface, but we can use it on other geometry types because you're essentially just trimming one geometry with another geometry. So we're going to trim all these boxes so that they fill the cavity between those two surfaces. Let's go to top view and I'm going to select the green geometry on the left hand side. And I'm just going to trim out this whole left hand side of our magenta trim geometry. So let's type in trim and just as a warning this is quite a slow command so we're only going to do a few at a time and just go slow. And let's just do this much and I want you to go really slow and I'm going to speed up my video until I've completed them all. So my trimming is complete and now if we go to perspective mode and turn our sweep off you can see that we've got a trimmed version of those boxes we've created. So now we're going to do the same thing for the other side. So I'm going to select this right hand wall and we're going to trim again to get that cavity geometry with the trim geometry. Once again, go slow with this and I'm going to speed my video up and skip ahead. Great, so the trimming's done and I'm going to turn my sweep layer off and we're going to go back into perspective. So we're pretty close to the geometry of the pavilion now. It's really starting to look a lot like the Serpentine Pavilion itself. The main thing that's different here is that the pavilion's actually made up of very rectilinear boxes. It doesn't have this curvaceous trim on it. So let's go to our layers and we're going to create a new layer called Boxes. Going to make it a lavender colour and we'll hit OK. And we'll make Boxes the current layer. And we're now going to use a command called bounding box. So what a bounding box is, is it's essentially a box that encapsulates a geometry whilst being in alignment to a plane. So in this case, our C plane. So let's type in bounding box. And I'm going to select this box here to start with. And watch your command line, make sure that you have cumulative equals no selected. And your output is solids. And then you get a box around your geometry that aligns to the C plane. Now the beauty of this is that we can actually select multiple geometries and do this all at once. So I'm going to select all of the geometry on my boxes layer and do another bounding box. Make sure cumulative is set to no and output to solids. And this will go and create a nice box around every single one of those trimmed boxes. And we can turn that trim layer off and now we're really, really close to the geometry of that serpentine pavilion. Now I'm going to pause the video here and skip ahead and do the exact same workflow for the other side of the wall. And I encourage you to do the same. Great, so I've gone ahead and modeled that second wall and I've got the entire geometry for the pavilion pretty much complete and ready. There's one last little tweak that I want to make to the pavilion before we're finished modeling. You'd notice in the actual pavilion that these boxes are actually open-ended. They're not closed off boxes. So we want to open up those ends of each of these boxes so we get that transparency coming through in the side elevations. There's a few ways that you could get rid of these. You could come into the boxes and do a shift control click on each of the faces and just hit delete, but this would take you an enormous amount of time. So one workflow that might be helpful to do this is let's go into our right mode and we're just going to turn shaded view on. We can use the delete faces command, which we used previously in the tutorial to select all of the faces in our pavilion. So any face that we've selected, if we hit return, they'll just be gone right now. But what we want to do right now is go through each row and column and deselect all the faces that are visible in this right view. So if you go through and deselect all of these rows and columns with the control key held down, you'll actually go into perspective mode and notice I'm deselecting all of those faces that we want to keep. But I'm going to be keeping the front faces that we want to delete. 
So if you do that for all the rows and columns, it's the quickest way to get rid of all of those front faces for this geometry. So I'm gonna go through and do this, and I'm gonna skip my video ahead because it's gonna take maybe five minutes to go through and select them all. Cool, that's the last row there done. And now if we jump over to perspective mode, you can see I've deselected all those faces, and if I hit return, it'll delete all of those front faces that we wanted to remove. And now I've completed the modeling of the Serpentine Pavilion by Bjarke Ingels. Once you've completed modeling your geometry, you might want to output your images in a more presentation style format. And there's a few settings we can change to do this. The first thing we can do is turn on the rendered viewport. So let's go to view and select rendered. You'll get a nicer image with some nice shadows and ambient light coming through. Another thing we can tweak is the Rhino Sun. So let's type sun into our command line and the sun panel will appear on the right. We're going to turn the sun on and we're going to enable manual control. So you can't see too much going on right now. We can change the directionality of the sun a little bit and we can change the height of it. But to truly see these shadows, you want to come into the rendering tab and you want to turn the ground plane on. Now the ground plane will enable shadows to be projected on. So if we go back to our sun, we can actually affect the rotation of these shadows and the direction. So once we've got the model set up visually in a way that we're happy with, we can easily go and save these images out in a high resolution. The best way to do this is with the view capture to file command. You'll get a little dialog box that will appear and give you some options to save your image out. You can turn off the grid, the world axis, the seaplane, and have a transparent background, and you can change the size of the viewport. I'm gonna change it to a custom size, and I'm gonna do 1920 by 1080, and then I'm gonna go OK and save that image out. And I'm gonna call it View Capture. And now you'll have this high resolution image of your Rhino model saved onto your file that you can use in a presentation. Rhino 8 comes with a collection of new features that extend our 3D modeling capabilities. Let's take a quick look at some of the key features in this release. First we have the shrink wrap command. Shrink wrap creates a watertight mesh around open or closed meshes, NURBS geometry, sub D and point clouds. On my screen I've got a staircase and it's made up of a collection of different parts and layers. If I select all the geometry and type in shrink wrap, I can create this watertight mesh. The target edge length is the resolution of the mesh faces. A larger number will give me a more inaccurate outcome. A smaller number will take longer to process but it will more finely snap to the geometry I have. We can also offset our shrink wrap by a specified distance. The obvious use case for this is 3D printing, but it's also useful for creating geometry from point clouds, wrapping large geometries for analysis inside Grasshopper, and just generally simplifying complex models with multiple parts. A small but powerful update to the SubD modeling toolkit is the extra customization of SubD creases. You can now control the crease strength of your geometry and create better transitions between smooth and hard edges in your model. If you double click along a sub D edge and use the sub D crease command, you can specify specific vertices with a number between 0 and 100, 0 meaning no crease and 100 meaning a full crease, and create a transition between no creases and full creases along your edge. This gives you the ability to create blended creases in your geometry, which can help fade hard edges into soft edges. There are also a collection of handy modeling additions that will make your workflows in Rhino faster and simpler. We can make our seaplanes automatically snap to any geometry we select. We can now use the gumball to cut through objects. And we can use the new push-pull command to enable a modeling workflow very similar to that found in SketchUp. Rhino 8 also comes with a large upgrade to the clipping and sectioning tools. We can add section hatches to a geometry cut by a clipping plane. We can change the layer hatch style and add an architectural concrete texture and change the scale and that will come through in our clip section. We can also create section views with the save clipping section views command. If we go to our layout and add a detail, we can now add this new view, which is the same name as the clipping plane.
We can also now adjust the clipping plane to add a custom clipping depth in the distance. You can also create live section drawings with clipping planes. If you use the clipping drawings command and select your clipping plane, you'll be asked to specify a location for your live drawing. I'm going to click here. And I'm going to turn off this hidden layer. And now I've got a live section. So when I go and update the location of my clipping plane, my section will also update as a drawing. Another great new clipping feature is the selective clipping tool. If we create a new clipping plane, we can select it and come up to below objects clipped and choose exclude selected. We can then choose to exclude layers from the clipping, which gives us greater control over visibility in the clipping plane. There are also updates to rendering, texture mapping, display ports, grasshopper tools, developer tools, and general Rhino commands. You can see these in more detail over at the new page of the Rhino 8 website. So congratulations on completing our Rhino for Beginners training course. We've only scratched the surface of what's possible with Rhino, but hopefully this gives you a great starting point. If you want to keep learning, check out some of our other tutorials we have available on thedifferentdesign.com.